Sushi! Section Sempra! Don't touch me! Don't you dare touch me! Hey there guys, Nordic Warrior here, welcome back to my video game review series. So those of you who have been following my channel will know that recently I've been reviewing every Harry Potter video game. In my last video I talked about The Order of the Phoenix from 2007. Today we're going to be looking at the sequel, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, released in 2009, developed by EA. This is going to be for the Xbox 360 version. So those of you who saw my review for The Order of the Phoenix will know that it was a game that was very good for the most part but I did have some mixed feelings on it. On the one hand, it had a great open world and lots of RPG elements, as well as plenty of dialogue and exploration. But at the same time, there were certain things about it that made it a bit of a chore to play, and it had some pretty tedious mechanics. So going into the Half-Blood Prince, there was plenty to work with, but at the same time, there were several changes that needed to be made, as well as some improvements. So does the Half-Blood Prince make these improvements? Or did they take a step backwards? Let's talk about it. So once again, the game is a third-person open-world action-adventure RPG based on the Half-Blood Prince movie. Once again, the game follows the story of the movie pretty loosely. Just like the movie, the game begins with Severus Snape colluding with Bellatrix Lestrange and her sister Narcissus Malfoy, and coming up with a plan to infiltrate Hogwarts. The Dark Lord knows I serve him. Bellatrix. Then swear to it. Make the unbreakable bow. You start the game off in the burrow where you get a brief introduction into the overall gameplay and are introduced to some of the characters. And what on earth is wrong with Ginny's eyes? Everyone gone to bed? I don't sleep these days. So I wash my hair. Silly, right? Happy Christmas, Harry. Seriously, that's one of the first things I noticed about this game. In the previous game, the character models all looked great, and resembled their movie counterparts almost perfectly. In this game, however, some of the characters look absolutely terrifying, particularly Ginny. You can seal something. This is where you come. Close your eyes. There. Now no one will find it. I've got a secret too. There's just something about the character's eyes in this game that really disturbs me. They look horrible, but I digress. In this tutorial, you also notice a few callbacks to previous games in the series. For example, Ron even pokes fun at the previous game. If you just take the time to learn some cleaning spells. He wants to spend that time cleaning things up. This was much more fun. Yeah, one of the criticisms EA got for The Order of the Phoenix was that a sizable portion of that game had you sweeping and mopping the floors and doing general cleaning duties around the castle. I'm glad they referenced that here, and I found it pretty funny. Also, it looks like the Weasleys finally decided to throw out that dangerous washing machine. You get a brief introduction into the spellcasting mechanics, as well as the flying. Yes, this game brings back broomstick flying. More on that later. As far as the spellcasting goes, the game pretty much uses the exact same mechanics as the Order of the Phoenix game, except it feels much more refined here. Spells work so much better this time, and are so much more responsive. You basically select your target, and then cast spells by moving the right thumbstick in the correct direction, depending on the spell you wish to cast. You have several different spells to unlock and use throughout the game. Just like the last game, you have regular spells and combat spells. You have Wingardium Leviosa, which once again is used to levitate items. The game has so many uses for this spell, and it's a spell that you'll be using throughout most of the game. You can use it to move obstacles, or to launch projectiles, or even to summon collectibles. Some of the uses for this include what in the previous game would be Accio. In this game, you can pretty much just use Wingardium Leviosa for those same tasks. You can even launch dung bombs using this. You have Reparo, which once again can be used to repair certain items. One of the main uses for this is to repair collectibles that can sometimes be broken in order to obtain them. 
You have Incendio that can be used to burn things in the environment such as obstacles, as well as to light up fireworks and set them off. In addition to these spells, as I mentioned before, you also have the combat spells which are used in wizard duels. Now in my review for the Order of the Phoenix, I talked about how one of the biggest criticisms I had for that game was the combat. The combat in that game was really poor, and the spells were often very unresponsive, and very unlikely to always work as they were supposed to. While fortunately in this game, the combat has been significantly improved. One of the biggest changes added this time is that they added a refined dueling system, which is really interesting. Dueling was something that had been featured in previous Harry Potter games, but if truth be told, it was always somewhat simplistic. In this game, you have a fantastic dueling system. At various stages of the game, while traversing the castle, you will be challenged by another student to a duel. Uh, no thanks. We're on our way to potions. I'm not asking you, potty. I'm telling you, stupefy! The game will then pit you in a one-on-one -on -one battle against the student where you will have to use your combat spells. The duels have a dodge feature where you can slip past enemy spells to avoid them and counter with your own spells. As you play through the game and take part in more duels, you will unlock more offensive spells. For example, you start off with stupefy, the standard attack spell. This basically consists of you shooting enemies to lower their health and at times can even be charged up to do significantly more damage. You have Protego, which is a defensive spell that creates a shield that can deflect enemy spells and help you avoid taking damage. You have Expelliarmus. This is used to knock enemies to the ground and immobilize them temporarily. This can give you a huge advantage in combat, as you can spam Stupefy at your opponent while they're on the ground. You have Protrificus Totalus that can be used to petrify enemies, for a short while, once again immobilizing them and giving you the opportunity to spam stupefy while they are completely defenseless. Once again, this gives you a huge advantage in combat. And finally, you have Levy Corpus. This is probably my favorite spell in the game, because you can use it to hang your opponent upside down and once again, this completely immobilizes them and gives you a huge advantage in combat. Interestingly, once you unlock Levy Corpus, the combat in the game becomes extremely easy. This is one of them games where once you figure out how to exploit the AI, the combat is a piece of cake. All you have to do is cast Levy Corpus on an enemy, and they will be hanging there for long enough for you to take them out with a fully charged Stupefy, or alternatively you could just spam Stupefy and still take them out easily enough. In addition to these regular duels, you will also come across various students being bullied around the castle at times. What's it got to do with you? Give it back. What are you going to do? Jinx me? Stupefy! You will then be tasked with dueling the bully and kicking their ass to save the student. This will gain you collectibles. You also have a feature where you can take part in various dueling clubs around the castle. For example, each Hogwarts house has their own dueling team, and when you join each club, you can take on each of their members one at a time, and eventually earn the right to challenge their house champion. It's really fun to do this, taking them out one by one and becoming the champion of each house. Not unlike what you could do in the PS1 version of Chamber of Secrets, except in this game, it's so much more varied and refined. So yeah, Harry can become the Hogwarts dueling champion once again. In addition to all this, even the game's boss battles use the exact same dueling mechanic. You get several boss battles throughout the game. For example, you take on Crab and Goyle several times throughout the game. Seriously, Crab and Goyle are absolute gluttons for punishment this time. I'll get you back for that. Now you know what it feels like to be bullied. You kick their asses over and over again, and they just won't leave you alone. They keep coming back for more. I mean, seriously, this is Harry's sixth year at Hogwarts, and he has beaten the absolute crap out of these goons on several occasions, and they still challenge him. But then again, they were never really known for their brains. Seriously, without Malfoy, Crab and Goyle don't know whether they're coming or going, and they are content with just attacking Harry for seemingly no reason. But I digress. You also take on the werewolf Fenner Greyback on two occasions, once while defending Ginny outside the burrow, and once during the game's finale. You also take on Bellatrix Lestrange twice, once again outside the burrow, and once again in the finale. You also take on Malfoy, as well as a couple of Death Eaters. As I mentioned before, pretty much all of the combat in the entire game uses the same refined dueling system, 
and it's much better than the combat in the Order of the Phoenix game. I really enjoyed it personally, and I think the combat is actually one of the best things about this game. You also have a two-player dueling feature, so you can play with a friend if you want to. In addition to the combat, the game has several other features. I mentioned before how the game is open world. Once again, just like the last game, you have a huge open world to explore. Hogwarts is a very big castle, and you have many of the same locations from the previous game. Even more polished and better graphics than before. Unfortunately though, they took away the ability to interact with most NPC students around the castle. And I'm not sure why that was removed, because it was one of the better things about the last game. Nonetheless, you have plenty of reasons to explore the castle, and as you play through the story, you will unlock new areas of Hogwarts to explore, including both the interior locations, as well as the grounds and outdoor areas of the castle. Much of the game is spent with Harry attending his lessons and socialising with the other students, as well as working with Dumbledore to obtain information about Voldemort from Professor Slughorn, just like in the movie. There are plenty of cutscenes to convey the story, and these look great for the most part. And the voice acting is pretty good. Where did you learn that spell? I... it was in a library book. Liar! You are to gather all your school books. All of them. You also get to take part in several scenes from the movie, such as Ron being spiked with love potion, and Harry needing to find a cure. You actually get to play as Ron at this part of the game. You also have a section where Harry takes a dose of liquid luck, and this leads to some pretty funny moments. In addition to the game's combat, exploration and story, you also have several mini-games and challenges to take part in. I mentioned before that the game brings back broomstick flying, you get several flying sections of the game, and these are a bit of a blast from the past. The game also brings back Quidditch, which is a welcome addition, but sadly Quidditch this time is a bit of a disappointment. It's even more basic and simplistic than it was in the PS1 games, and this is a HD game from 2009, so I don't quite understand. I mean, the PS2 version of Chamber of Secrets has a more refined Quidditch feature than this game, and to an even larger extent, the excellent Quidditch World Cup game. You would have expected this game to show some more innovation here, and give us a more refined Quidditch system, but instead Quidditch basically consists of flying through rings, and racing against another seeker to catch the snitch. So while I appreciate the return of Quidditch, it was just a little bit disappointing. You get several Quidditch games throughout the game, and even get to play as Ginny at one point. Not regular Ginny terrifying Ginny with those eyes. Those eyes, man. In addition to this, the game also brings back potion making, and here there is a lot of innovation. The potion making this time no longer consists of a simple quick time event. This time you actually get a more varied and refined potion making minigame. You basically get a cauldron and a whole bunch of ingredients, and the game will give you the instructions and the recipe for you to follow to make a particular potion. You will need to add the ingredients at the right time, and even heat up the cauldron when prompted to. There are several moments in the game where you will be tasked with brewing a particular potion for a character, including several antidotes and cures, and also including making a party punch for Slughorn's party. These potion minigames are a lot of fun, and some of them are really challenging too. You will need to take care and try not to make a mess, as well as make the potion as quickly and efficiently as possible to get a better score. You can even join a potion making club at one point, and make some tougher and more complicated potions here and there, and try to beat your high score at making each potion. Potions are actually a big theme in this game, just like they are in the movie. The game also has plenty of collectibles to find. You have many Hogwarts crests scattered around the castle that you can find and obtain. There are 150 of them in the game, and while this might seem like a bit of a chore, they are actually not that difficult to find, and they're pretty easy to obtain. Many of them will require a particular spell to obtain, such as Wingardium Leviosa or Reparo. Like I said before, these are actually quite easy to find, and it's surprisingly fun to do. As I mentioned before, the game has a huge open world, and these collectibles give you a reason to explore it. Just like the last game, you have several portraits that can provide shortcuts for you. These can help you traverse the castle quicker. You also get to explore the castle at different times of day. 
You get some level and location variety with a couple of sections of the game taking place in the borough. So that pretty much sums up my overall views on the Half-Blood Prince. It's a much more fast-paced and action-packed game than The Order of the Phoenix, and many of the overall technicalities and features have been much more refined and improved. But at the same time, the RPG elements such as the dialogue and story seem to have been a bit watered down, and the game is a bit too short for my liking. The Quidditch games are a bit of a disappointment, and while the graphics are great for the most part, as I mentioned before, some of the character models are awful. It's the eyes, man. Like, seriously, what is wrong with the eyes? Ginny in particular. So yeah, the game is great for the most part, but I wouldn't say it was the best game in the series or anything. I give the Half-Blood Prince a solid 7 out of 10. Let me know what you guys think. Stay tuned for my next review, where we're going to be looking at the sequel, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1, as well as many more retrospective video game reviews. Thanks for watching and God bless.